Chapter Two of Winds of Doctrine: Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Two: Modernism and Christianity, Part One. Prevalent winds of doctrine must needs penetrate at last into the cloister. Social instability and moral confusion, reconstructions of history and efforts after reform, are things characteristic of the present age. And under the name of modernism they have made their appearance even in that institution which is constitutionally the most stable, of most explicit mind, least inclined to revise its collective memory or established usages i mean the catholic church even after this church was constituted by the fusion of many influences and by the gradual exclusion of those heresies some of them older than explicit orthodoxy which seemed to misrepresent its implications or spirit there still remained an inevitable propensity among catholics to share the moods of their respective ages and countries and to reconcile them if possible with their professed faith often these cross influences were so strong that the profession of faith was changed frankly to suit them and catholicism was openly abandoned but even where this did not occur we may detect in the catholic minds of each age some strange conjunctions and compromises with the zeitgeist thus the morality of chivalry and war the ideals of foppishness and honour had been long maintained side by side with the maxims of the gospel which they entirely contradict later the system of copernicus incompatible at heart with the anthropocentric and moralistic view of the world which christianity implies was accepted by the church with some lame attempt to render it innocuous but it remains an alien and hostile element like a spent bullet lodged in the flesh in more recent times we have heard of liberal catholicism the attitude assumed by some generous but divided minds too much attached to their traditional religion to abandon it but too weak and too hopeful not to glow also with enthusiasm for modern liberty and progress had those minds been i will not say intelligently catholic but radically christian they would have felt that this liberty was simply liberty to be damned and this progress not an advance towards the true good of man but a lapse into endless and heathen wanderings for christianity in its essence and origin was an urgent summons to repent and come out of just such a worldly life as modern liberty and progress hold up as an ideal to the nations in the roman empire as in the promised land of liberalism each man sought to get and to enjoy as much as he could and supported a ponderous government neutral as to religion and moral traditions but favourable to the accumulation of riches so that a certain enlightenment and cosmopolitanism were made possible and private passions and tastes could be gratified without encountering persecution or public obloquy though not without a general relaxation of society and a vulgarizing of arts and manners that something so self-indulgent and worldly as this ideal of liberalism could have been thought compatible with christianity the first initiation into which in baptism involves renouncing the world might well astonish us had we not been rendered deaf to moral discords by the very din which from our birth they have been making in our ears but this is not all primitive christianity was not only a summons to turn one's heart and mind away from a corrupt world it was a summons to do so under pain of instant and terrible punishment it was the conviction of pious jews since the days of the prophets that mercilessness avarice and disobedience to revealed law were the direct path to ruin a world so wicked as the liberal world against which st john the baptist thundered was necessarily on the verge of destruction sin although we moderns may not think so seemed to the ancient jews a fearful imprudence the hand of the lord would descend on it heavily and very soon the whole roman civilization was to be overthrown in the twinkling of an eye those who hoped to be of the remnant and to be saved so as to lead a clarified and heavenly life in the new jerusalem must hasten to put on sackcloth and ashes to fast and to pray to watch with girded loins for the coming of the kingdom 
it was superfluous for them to study the dead past or to take thought for the morrow the cataclysm was at hand a new heaven and a new earth far more worthy of study would be unrolled before that very generation there was indeed something terribly levelling revolutionary serious and expectant about that primitive gospel and in so far as liberalism possessed similar qualities in so far as it was moved by indignation pity and fervent hope it could well preach on early christian texts but the liberal catholics were liberals of the polite and governmental sort they were shocked at suffering rather than at sin and they feared not the lord but the movement of public opinion some of them were vaguely pious men whose conservatism in social and moral matters forbade them to acquiesce in the disappearance of the church altogether and they thought it might be preserved as the english church is by making opportune concessions others were simply aristocrats desirous that the pacifying influence of religion should remain strong over the masses the clergy was not in any considerable measure tossed by these opposing currents the few priests who were liberals were themselves men of the world patriots and orators such persons could not look forward to a fierce sifting of the wheat from the tares or to any burning of whole bundles of nations for they were nothing if not romantic nationalists and the idea of faggots of any sort was most painful to their minds they longed rather for a sweet cohabitation with everybody and a mild tolerance of almost everything a war for religion seemed to them a crime but a war for nationality glorious and holy no wonder that their work in nation-building has endured while their sentiments in religion are scattered to the winds the liberalism for the sake of which they were willing to eviscerate their christianity has already lost its vitality it survives as a pale parliamentary tradition impotent before the tide of socialism rising behind its back the catholicism which they wish to see gently lingering is being driven out of national life by official spoliations and popular mockeries it is fast becoming what it was in the beginning a sect with more or less power to alienate the few who genuinely adhere to it from the pagan society in which they are forced to live the question what is true or essential christianity is a thorny one because each party gives the name of genuine christianity to what it happens to believe thus professor harnack not to mention less distinguished historians makes the original essence of christianity coincide what a miracle with his own lutheran and kantian sentiments but the essence of christianity as of everything else is the whole of it and the genuine nature of a seed is at least as well expressed by what it becomes in contact with the earth and air as by what it seems in its primitive minuteness it is quite true as the modernists tell us that in the beginning christian faith was not a matter of scholastic definitions nor even of intellectual dogmas religions seldom begin in that form and paganism was even less intellectual and less dogmatic than early christianity the most primitive christian faith consisted in a conversion of the whole man intellect habits and affections from the life of the world to a new mystical life in answer to a moral summons and a prophecy about destiny the moral summons was to renounce home kindred possessions the respect of men the hypocrisies of the synagogue and to devote oneself to a wandering and begging life healing praying and preaching and preaching what preaching the prophecy about destiny which justified that conversion and renunciation preaching that the world in its present constitution was about to be destroyed on account of its wickedness and that the ignorant the poor and the downtrodden if they trusted this prophecy and turned their backs at once on all the world pursues would be saved in the new deluge and would form a new society of a more or less supernatural kind to be raised on the ruins of all present institutions the poor were called but the rich were called also and perhaps even the heathen for there was in all men even in all nature this is the one touch of speculative feeling in the gospel a precious potentiality of goodness all were essentially amiable though accidentally wretched and depraved and by the magic of a new faith and hope this soul of goodness in all living things might be freed from the hideous incubus of circumstance that now oppresses it 
and might come to bloom openly as the penetrating eye of the lover even now sees that it could bloom love then and sympathy particularly towards the sinful and diseased a love relieved of sentimentality by the deliberate practice of healing warning and comforting a complete aversion from all the interests of political society and a confident expectation of a cataclysm that should suddenly transfigure the world such was christian religion in its origin the primitive christian was filled with a sense of a special election and responsibility and of a special hope he was serene abstracted incorruptible his inward eye fixed on a wonderful revelation he was as incapable of attacking as of serving the state he despised or ignored everything for which the state exists labor wealth power felicity splendor and learning with christ the natural man in him had been crucified and in christ he had risen again a spiritual man to walk the earth as a messenger from heaven for a few more years his whole life was an experience of perpetual graces and miracles the prophecy about the speedy end of this wicked world was not fulfilled as the early christians expected but this fact is less disconcerting to the christian than one would suppose the spontaneous or instinctive christian and there is such a type of mind quite apart from any affiliation to historic christianity takes a personal and dramatic view of the world its values and even its reality are the values and reality which it may have for him it would profit him nothing to win it if he lost his own soul that prophecy about the destruction of nature springs from this attitude nature must be subservient to the human conscience it must satisfy the hopes of the prophet and vindicate the saints that the years should pass and nothing should seem to happen need not shatter the force of this prophecy for those whose imagination it excites this world must actually vanish very soon for each of us and this is the point of view that counts with the christian mind even if we consider posterity the kingdoms and arts and philosophies of this world are short-lived they shift their aims continually and shift their substance the prophecy of their destruction is therefore being fulfilled continually the need of repentance if one would be saved is truly urgent and the means of that salvation cannot be an operation upon this world but faith in another world that in the experience of each soul is to follow upon it thus the summons to repent and the prophecy about destiny which were the root of christianity can fully retain their spirit when for this wicked world we read this transitory life and for the coming of the kingdom we read life everlasting the change is important but it affects the application rather than the nature of the gospel morally there is a loss because men will never take so hotly what concerns another life as what affects this one speculatively on the other hand there is a gain for the expectation of true transformations and millenniums on earth is a very crude illusion while the relation of the soul to nature is an open question in philosophy and there will always be a great loftiness and poetic sincerity in the feeling that the soul is a stranger in this world and has other destinies in store what would make the preaching of the gospel utterly impossible would be the admission that it had no authority to proclaim what has happened or what is going to happen either in this world or in another a prophecy about destiny is an account however vague of events to be actually experienced and of their causes the whole inspiration of hebraic religion lies in that it was not metaphorically that sodom and gomorrah were destroyed the promised land was a piece of earth the kingdom was an historical fact it was not symbolically that israel was led into captivity or that it returned and restored the temple it was not ideally that a messiah was to come memory of such events is in the same field as history prophecy is in the same field as natural science natural science too is an account of what will happen and under what conditions it too is a prophecy about destiny accordingly while it is quite true that speculations about nature and history are not contained explicitly in the religion of the gospel yet the message of this religion is one which speculations about nature and reconstructions of history may extend congruously or may contradict and totally annul 
if physical science should remove those threats of destruction to follow upon sin which christian prophecy contains or if it should prove that what brings destruction is just that unworldly prayerful all-forgiving idle and revolutionary attitude which the gospel enjoins then physical science would be incompatible with christianity not with this or that text of the bible merely about the sun standing still or the dead rising again but with the whole foundation of what christ himself with john the baptist st paul st james and st john preached to the world even the pagan poets when they devised a myth half believed in it for a fact what really lent some truth moral truth only to their imaginations was indeed the beauty of nature the comedy of life or the groans of mankind crushed between the upper and the nether millstones but being scientifically ignorant they allowed their pictorial wisdom to pass for a revealed science for a physics of the unseen if even among the pagans the poetic expression of human experience could be mistaken in this way for knowledge of occult existences how much more must this have been the case among a more ignorant and a more intense nation like the jews indeed events are what the jews have always remembered and hoped for if their religion was not a guide to events an assured means towards a positive and experimental salvation it was nothing their religion was meagre in the description of the lord's nature but rich in the description of his ways indeed their belief in the existence and power of the lord if we take it pragmatically and not imaginatively was simply the belief in certain moral harmonies in destiny in the sufficiency of conduct of a certain sort to secure success and good fortune both national and personal this faith was partly an experience and partly a demand it turned on history and prophecy history was interpreted by a prophetic insight into the moral principle believed to govern it and prophecy was a passionate demonstration of the same principles at work in the catastrophes of the day or of the morrow there is no doubt a platonic sort of religion a worship of the ideal apart from its power to realize itself which has entered largely into the life of christians and the more mystical and disinterested they were the more it has tended to take the place of hebraism but the platonists too when left to their instincts follow their master in attributing power and existence by a sort of cumulative worship and imaginative hyperbole to what in the first place they worship because it is good to divorce then as the modernists do the history of the world from the story of salvation and god's government and the sanctions of religion from the operation of matter is a fundamental apostasy from christianity christianity being a practical and living faith in a possible eventual redemption from sin from the punishment for sin from the thousand circumstances that make the most brilliant worldly life a sham and a failure essentially involves a faith in a supernatural physics in such an economy of forces behind within and around the discoverable forces of nature that the destiny which nature seems to prepare for us may be reversed that failures may be turned into successes ignominy into glory and humble faith into triumphant vision and this not merely by a change in our point of view or estimation of things but by an actual historical physical transformation in the things themselves to believe this in our day may require courage even a certain childish simplicity but were not courage and a certain childish simplicity always requisite for christian faith it never was a religion for the rationalist and the worldling it was based on alienation from the world from the intellectual world no less than from the economic and political it flourished in the oriental imagination that is able to treat all existence with disdain and to hold it superbly at arm's length and at the same time is subject to visions and false memories is swayed by the eloquence of private passion and raises confidently to heaven the cry of the poor the bereaved and the distressed its daily bread from the beginning was hope for a miraculous change of scene for prison walls falling to the ground about it for a heart inwardly comforted and a shower of good things from the sky it is clear that a supernaturalistic faith of this sort which might wholly inspire some revolutionary sect can never wholly inspire human society 
whenever a nation is converted to christianity its christianity in practice must be largely converted into paganism the true christian is in all countries a pilgrim and a stranger not his kinsman but whoever does the will of his father who is in heaven is his brother and sister and mother and his real compatriot in a nation that calls itself christian every child may be pledged at baptism to renounce the world the flesh and the devil but the flesh will assert itself notwithstanding the devil will have its due and the nominal christian become a man of business and the head of a family will form an integral part of that very world which he will pledge his children to renounce in turn as he holds them over the font the lips even the intellect may continue to profess the christian ideal but public and social life will be guided by quite another the ages of faith the ages of christian unity were such only superficially when all men are christians only a small element can be christian in the average man the thirteenth century for instance is supposed to be the golden age of catholicism but what seems to have filled it if we may judge by the witness of dante little but bitter conflicts racial and religious faithless rebellions both in states and in individuals against the christian regimen worldliness in the church barbarism in the people and a dawning of all sorts of scientific and aesthetic passions in themselves quite pagan and contrary to the spirit of the gospel christendom at that time was by no means a kingdom of god on earth it was a conglomeration of incorrigible rascals intellectually more or less christian we may see the same thing under different circumstances in the spain of philip the second here was a government consciously laboring in the service of the church to resist turks convert pagans banish moslems and crush protestants yet the very forces engaged in defending the church the army and the inquisition were alien to the christian life they were fit embodiments rather of chivalry and greed or of policy and jealous dominion the ecclesiastical forces also theology ritual and hierarchy employed in spreading the gospel were themselves alien to the gospel an anti-worldly religion finds itself in fact in this dilemma if it remains merely spiritual developing no material organs it cannot affect the world while if it develops organs with which to operate on the world these organs become a part of the world from which it is trying to wean the individual spirit so that the moment it is armed for conflict such a religion has two enemies on its hands it is stifled by its necessary armour and adds treason in its members to hostility in its foes the passions and arts it uses against its opponents are as fatal to itself as those which its opponents array against it in every age in which a supernaturalistic system is preached we must accordingly expect to find the world standing up stubbornly against it essentially unconverted and hostile whatever name it may have been christened with and we may expect the spirit of the world to find expression not only in overt opposition to the supernaturalistic system but also in the surviving or supervening worldliness of the faithful such an insidious revulsion of the natural man against a religion he does not openly discard is what in modern christendom we call the renaissance no less than the revolution which is the later open rebellion against the same traditions the renaissance is radically inimical to christianity to say that christianity survives even if weakened or disestablished is to say that the renaissance and the revolution are still incomplete far from being past events they are living programs the ideal of the renaissance is to restore pagan standards in polite learning in philosophy in sentiment and in morals it is to abandon and exactly reverse one's baptismal vows instead of forsaking this wicked world the men of the renaissance accept love and cultivate the world with all its pomp and vanities they believe in the blamelessness of natural life and in its perfectibility or they cling at least to a noble ambition to perfect it and a glorious ability to enjoy it instead of renouncing the flesh they feed refine and adorn it their arts glorify its beauty and its passions and far from renouncing the devil if we understand by the devil the proud assertion on the part of the finite of its autonomy autonomy of the intellect in science autonomy of the heart and will in morals 
the men of the renaissance are possessed by the devil altogether they worship nothing and acknowledge authority in nothing save in their own spirit no opposition could be more radical and complete than that between the renaissance and the anti-worldly religion of the gospel i see a vision nietzsche says somewhere so full of meaning yet so wonderfully strange cesar borgia becomes pope do you understand ah that would verily have been the triumph for which i am longing to-day then christianity would have been done for and nietzsche goes on to accuse luther of having spoiled this lovely possibility which was about to be realized by frightening the papacy out of its mellow paganism into something like a restoration of the old acrid christianity a dream of this sort even if less melodramatic than nietzsche's has visited the mind of many a neo-catholic or neo-pagan if the humanistic tendency of the renaissance could have worked on unimpeded might not a revolution from above a gradual rationalization have transformed the church its dogma might have been insensibly understood to be nothing but myth its miracles nothing but legend its sacraments mere symbols its bible pure literature its liturgy just poetry its hierarchy and administrative convenience its ethics and historical accident and its whole function simply to lend a warm mystical aureole to human culture and ignorance the reformation prevented this euthanasia of christianity it re-expressed the unenlightened absolutism of the old religion it insisted that dogma was scientifically true that salvation was urgent and fearfully doubtful that the world and the worldly paganized church were as sodom and gomorrah and that sin though natural to man was to god an abomination in fighting this movement which soon became heretical the catholic church had to fight it with its own weapons and thereby reawakened in its own bosom the same sinister convictions it did not have to dig deep to find them even without luther convinced catholics would have appeared in plenty to prevent cesar borgia had he secured the tiara from being pope in any novel fashion or with any revolutionary result the supernaturalism the literal realism the otherworldliness of the catholic church are too much the soul of it to depart without causing its dissolution while the church lives at all it must live on the strength which these principles can lend it and they are not altogether weak persons who feel themselves to be exiles in this world and what noble mind from empedocles down has not had that feeling are mightily inclined to believe themselves citizens of another there will always be spontaneous instinctive christians and when under the oppression of sin salvation is looked for and miracles are expected the supernatural scheme of salvation which historical christianity offers will not always be despised the modernists think the church is doomed if it turns a deaf ear to the higher criticism or ignores the philosophy of m bergson but it has outlived greater storms a moment when any exotic superstition can find excitable minds to welcome it when new and grotesque forms of faith can spread among the people when the ultimate impotence of science is the theme of every cheap philosopher when constructive philology is reefing its sails when the judicious grieve at the portentous metaphysical shams of yesterday and smile at those of to-day such a moment is rather ill-chosen for prophesying the extinction of a deep-rooted system of religion because your own studies make it seem to you incredible especially if you hold a theory of knowledge that regards all opinions as arbitrary postulates which it may become convenient to abandon at any moment end of chapter two part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine